All right, guys, welcome back to the Steel Forum. Today, we're going to talk a lot about those starting to get prepared for that year ending uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, but more importantly, tax time, getting your books wrapped up, looking forward to that fourth quarter. Did you do well? Did you do badly? Hear about how we did this year with COVID, everything else, all here today in the Steel Forum. buddy welcome back i uh it, it, it's starting to get a little bit cold out there it's getting chilly getting towards that end of the year wanted to give people a little bit of time to start thinking about their end of the year stuff you're a specialist kind of in accounting that's that's your main gig as we get to the end of the year what should detailers be thinking about to to wrap well, up the final quarter for sure you want to be sure you're checking in with your cpa and find out about what are your end of year tax planning strategies that you can be looking at? What are your sections 179s that you can look for deductions? Right, right, right. Stop right there. Explain yeah. section 179 for the people who don't know what that is. Okay. So section 179 is what basically it's, it's commonly referred to as first year expensing. So think about this way. If you buy a large piece of property, you don't get to write off that property in the first year that you own it. Right. You have to amortize that out over some years. Well, the same thing would generally work with anything that you depreciate. So you buy $30,000 worth of software, you then have to depreciate that software over a certain number of years. And it depends on what it is you have and how you structure that. But what section 179 does is it lets you write it all off in the year that you get it. Because if you think about this, if you paid for that software all up front, that money has left you. You are, you should not be paying taxes on that money, but you're now going to use that tax deduction over five years, 10 years, however it's structured. But wouldn't it be better to have that handled all in the one year that you bought it? And also as a way to strategize this and what we do is we start thinking about, do I need to pick up more software at the end of the year? Because I can get it squared away. I can get on a payment plan, but the invoice is there. I owe that money. I have made that purchase and I can write that off count it against my income. Let's say we had a really great year. We want to get that software in. And then next year, maybe it doesn't go so hot. I may not have the ability to write off that much depreciation next year, but this year I made the money. I need to write it off and, and trim down my taxable income as much as possible. And that's where that comes into play. Yeah. And this is particularly important for people who are being taxed like on a 1099 basis, because if you do not save enough, if you do not contribute enough taxes through estimated taxes quarterly and you're short on that and it turns out that, okay, you had a great third or maybe even fourth quarter and you have a lot of profit coming in, a lot of that 1099 income. If you underpaid your estimated taxes, you'll pay a penalty right. on that money. So, and that could be a pretty hefty penalty as I understand it. So it might actually be worth it. You could be actually looking at kind of a, a discount for picking up that whatever it is, whether it's your, your computer, uh, your new monitors, a piece of software, a new server, whatever it happens to be by, by looking forward into that. And that's kind of what this episode is all about, kind of looking forward. Because it, 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 for us, we use the CPA. And I think that's really important. I think most detailers should get themselves a CPA. You deal with it more. What are some of the reasons right? That a CPA is kind of important. So a CPA is somebody who they're, they're trained, they're current, and they're always on top of the recent tax changes. And it's not like these things are ever standing still. There's always tax changes, but this is someone that's in your corner and they're going to help you strategize. Uh, a lot of people that never had any experience with a CPA, they think of a, them as a tax preparer. Sure. You know, well, it's just it's just like going to H&R Block. I just show up and I drop off all my paperwork. No, 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 no. At G Around June, I'm talking to the CPA, starting to kind of figure out where we are, where we expect to be. I talk to him again in October. As we get in November, December, we're getting those final plans hammered out. Is there anything more I need to buy? Is there anything different I need to do? any other tax withholdings, any things, programs we should get into. He's, he's 
you know, the guy to talk to, to get all of that information squared away. And yeah, it's going to cost more than dropping off your paperwork at H and R block, but it's worth it. You know, we, we discussed things with him and wound up actually restructuring our company early on. And it saved us thousands and thousands of dollars a year because of the way you're taxed, you know, your corporate structure dictates how you're taxed and there's better ways and worse ways to do it. And, you know, if you go in and you just sign up and start a company, you yeah. might just be going with something that's wrong for you, but it's easy for the lawyer to set up, you know. It, and even if you have uh, have payroll you services, you, you really can't rely on them to get this stuff right. We've had a couple instances where our CPA has told us, listen, your, your payroll person is doing it wrong. You're going to face fines. You're going to face penalties, whatever yep. else, if you don't fix this. Can you think of some other ways, specifics, right, that our CPA has been worth the money they cost? And then second, two-part question here. How much does it actually cost, do you think, annually for us to have a CPA? So other ways that he's helped us, we actually, uh, we started out with a payroll company who was a widely known and, and well-renowned company, and they just did terrible for us because, as it turns out, they were set up to handle large corporations. They were not set up to handle small and we had a 401k and they entirely mismanaged its setup. Everything about it was wrong. And when we changed payroll companies, we had to get everything kind of fixed. We got in, but this was when we got a CPA is when we got set up with this guy initially. And when we restructured everything with our new payroll company and our, we got a TPA, a third party administrator to handle our 401k, he actually did the negotiating with the old payroll company because they had a fee to cancel everything. And, you know, he, he wound up saving us something like a thousand dollars, I think, uh, yeah. just to get out of that initial company. And he worked with the new company to kind of smooth over us getting in with the new one. So they wound up cutting us some slack too on setting up the new 401k. Uh, I forget what your other question was. Oh, how much uh, does it cost? Yeah. So generally, and you know, we're, We've got a, a somewhat more complicated corporate situation. We're not sure. just running a straight LLC. We're we're S corporation. So we've got additional filings. It's not just a straight, you know, our receipts are our income and that's the end of it. We've actually got a corporate filing. So we're paying somewhere in the vicinity of about $1,500 for that ta yeah. corporate tax filing. And, you know, it's it's worth every penny because just that switch over to that more complicated structure at the time. And this was years ago, saved us four or $5,000 a year in taxes. So and it's more than paid for itself. There's this peace of mind that comes with it too. Right. Like, I, I don't know if you've ever had any run-ins with the IRS. Right. But there's just this, this kind of fear in your head that, Hey, I screwed something up. I did something wrong. I didn't file correctly. And then something like this pandemic happens where, you need to, to access PPP. You need to do some filing based on your tax receipts from the last whatever. And having sure. that CPA on our side and knowing that they stand behind what they said, which that I, I'm not exactly sure the structure, but it's a lot like an EOR, right? Where there's a degree to which they are legally obligated to stand behind you, right? Based on right. what they told you. And having that peace of mind is, is a big deal. So... Uh, yeah, sure. You know, and all throughout the year, we, ha we have little questions. You know, they've given us referrals to things like uh, attorneys and, and people who can help us file other paperwork. They're, they're inter integral members of a business community that we can't necessarily access, that we wouldn't know how to access. And so you really, you do want one that's a partner too. We've gone through a couple. Sure. There were, there were ones that were just glorified tax preparers, right? They never, right. they never gave us advice in advance of it's too late now, but maybe next time. And right. that's, you know, if you, if you're interviewing CPAs and you should interview them, you shouldn't just pick them, right? You oh, should yeah. say, listen, what about the rest of the year when it's not me asking questions? Do you have outreach? Do you talk to me? What's going on? And, and find somebody who's more of a partner than just a, a, a one-way communication.
Yeah. One of the things I really like about this guy is, you know, every couple of months he'll shoot me an email. Hey, have you heard about this program? He'll, he'll let me know what's going on. What are the changes coming down the line? Um, we talked recently about, actually, this was a, a year or two back, but there was changes to how your depreciation was shifted front weighted versus back weighted at the beginning of the year, end of the year. And somehow that adjusted something with your taxes. So we, we got into a discussion on that. Uh, all kinds of little things that just, they just change and you're just not aware of it, but it's nice to stay on top of it. It's, it's our access to what's going on that we need to be aware of in, in these. Yeah. When the PPP stuff came up, the pay tech protection. Oh, I was program. talking to him on the daily. Yeah. They, they just about filled out our forms for us. Right. Because we worked with them a lot and they had the information that they needed. They knew, right. They've got other clients who are dealing with the same thing, same thing. And right. again, I'm going to refer you back. If you're not already on the discord server, a bunch of you are right. Join up. Okay. Find us on the discord server. So you have questions about tax time. You got other detailers that, that can talk to you. I will try to get those links down in the show notes. Sometimes I forget, but they, the link is on our, our, uh, our drafting table discussion from uh, two weeks ago or, or one week ago now, I think actually. So if, 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 if I forget to put it down here, drop us a comment or look at that other video and it's down there. But we've already started having some nice discussions there. So join up. Um, so what are some of the steps that you have to take? Is, is any of that actually do like that you start preparing now or does the actual like closing of the books and all that stuff, is that where it starts? So I would get into your planning as early as possible. Like I said, we start our early stages of planning around June, July. When, once you've got through half the year, you can kind of begin to project where you think you're going to land for the rest of the year. And then what you have to do is you're checking in at least once a quarter to see how that projection is holding up. Yeah. You know, am I still on track? Is it still going to plan? Because it's construction. So quarter to quarter, things change. You usually expect a slowdown in the winter. You know, you, you kind of have to stay on top of that as you go. But as you get closer and closer to the end of the year, you have more of that data in, you know, things aren't going to change that much as you get to those last one or two months. And that's really when it's time to make your decision. And you'll start to see too, especially if you're signed up on, if you've been slammed by a bunch of people's mailing lists, God help you. If you ever go to an NASCC, you're on everybody's mailing list. <laughs> got, you're in the system at that point, but you'll start getting flooded with those. Hey, it's end of year. Do you need to buy a CNC machine? Do you need some software? That's yep. what they're, that's what they're pinging on right there is this is your chance to load up on some really expensive stuff and knock your taxable income down and get a tax break on it before, because if you buy it in the beginning of the year, you've spent the money, you don't get the tax break for a whole nother year. But if you pick this up now in December, a couple of months from now, when you're paying your taxes, you've got something to write off and it's a big one. So we've always thought about winter, right? As our slow period, at least kind of in our head, right? It's harder to dig. It's harder to do that stuff. But is the date, does the data actually support that? Are we slower during winter? Because historically it's, it seemed boom and bust, but not consistently slow. No, it hasn't been consistently slow. What we tend to find is that's when we start to see um, a lot of renovation work, indoor projects really start flooding in. And also we get those earlier bids on the big projects that are coming up for next year, because before you can dig, you have to design. So uh, well, that's when we're starting to see. Before well, you, you can dig, you should. Should design. design. Historically, <laughs> not the case. They'll dig whenever they want. Got that right. Actually, uh, right down the road from me, we've got a big construction project on our county courthouse. Mm -hmm. And it's all tore up. And we were just driving to go vote. And <laughs> I was talking to my wife. And it's like, you know, if they don't pour that concrete soon, it's not going to be poured until next year. It's, you might want to get a move on it. And they're still digging and messing around. They're working on some steps and just trying to reduce some concrete. Yeah. Well, hopefully it gives them the time they need to actually finish their design because I guarantee you that that's not done yet. Based on some of the projects we've seen come through recently. No, yeah. No, not yep. at all. A lot of them. <laughs> Pretty much every one of them. Um, Incomplete is an understatement. Yeah. The, the other thing that I like to start thinking about right now, or it, just to kind of keep in my head, 
right, is those those holidays and how that's going to affect your ability to get stuff done. You know, you know Thanksgiving, you have off. You, and most people have Friday off. At best, you're going to get a half day of productivity uh, of your workers on either the Wednesday before or the Monday after, depending on how their vacation goes. Same thing happens again at Christmas, and then it's immediately New Year's. So, right. um, and I think Christmas falls on a Friday this year. Let's take a look here. No, Christmas actually falls on the Saturday. Okay. So you'll think about the holiday pay. You know, are you going to take the 24th off? We, of course, will because we're closed on Fridays generally anyways. Um, so we'll have that day off. But there's all of that lost productivity. Uh, New Year's Eve is a, a Friday. So are you going to take the Friday off? That's what I would recommend. We'll probably take the Friday off. Um but also, it, it's kind of time to start, it, at least what you and I do, looking back at that year and saying, hey, how, how did everything go? What did we screw up? What did we do well? What are we, you know, how do we have to finish? Did we finish? Are we a little bit low right now? Are we tracking well? This year, it's, it's particularly difficult because of the, the, the effects of COVID on the economy it's hard to compare our year to other years because we've had a strong year as far as growth, right? But right. not as far as gross profitability because there were months where we were just kind of waiting for stuff when that uh, the, the market yeah. was slow. Yeah, the first part of the year, we were really just trickling. At any given time, if you ask me how much work do we have left to go, I would say we're going to be done and out of work at the end of the day on Friday. Like when we come in on Monday, we're out of work. And then Monday would come around and somebody would send us a job and it's like, okay, we've got work for the week. It's not yeah. much, but it'll get us through the week. And then Friday again, you know, same thing. All right, we're out of work. We don't have anything more. But miraculously, it's like every single Monday we would come in and there would be something sitting on our table. Like, hey, I need you guys to draw this. Yep. Okay. But it was a very, it was, it was a hand to mouth year. I will say that for it us. Was. And, you know, I, I don't know if that's industry wide. I don't know how everybody else is doing. I hope to hear from them. Um, you know, it, definitely I've seen worse years overall, oh, yeah. I think considering the the global implications of everything that's gone down, we didn't end up too badly, right? We kind of weathered that storm. I don't, I, I haven't heard a lot of, of, a lot of detailing companies going under or detailers ending up underneath water, which is really interesting, right? Like it seems like whatever was done, it leveled things out just a little bit to keep that dip from hitting too hard. Right. And whoever you want to say response is responsible for it. I, I couldn't give credit credit to one side of the aisle or the other. It, it kind of worked, right? Like it, we ended up, yeah, it's just, there, there were definitely some, some people that were hard hit, but the economy as a whole is not a tank or tanked completely, which right. I think is interesting. It's the most interesting economy I've ever seen because there's, uh, this this weird dip in in supply, and usually you would see the 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 people unemployment kind of drop. It's it's weird, right? Because they keep talking about this late labor shortage, but there's the same amount of people around. They're the same jobs are that I I don't understand it. Yeah, it's I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around that because you hear how we have all these employers looking to hire people and they're paying all this premium, but nobody wants to go work for them. It seems like no matter how much the, the job is offered for, but at the same time, that's your golden opportunity to make more money. Why aren't you taking it? But then you find out, well, it seems I don't need that extra job. Maybe we can get by on one income. You know, that was something that we realized during 2020. I don't know if we're just We've deleted a bunch of people from the labor force, but we're still counting them towards unemployment or what? I think too, one of the things is that 
yeah, there there are there's high unemployment in sectors, but it's because a lot of people have just chosen to wait and get that job that they actually want, that they're almost qualified for that. So I, I think that's some of it, but I don't think one explanation is going to fill this whole thing up regardless yeah. of which it's explanation you pick. Yeah. There's it, yeah. It seems to be a patchwork because I mean, just for me, if, if, if I've completely lost my job and unemployment has run out and you know, Hey, it's time then it's time. I can't afford to just not go back. Even if you look at, okay, I've got three kids. I've child tax credit is treating me well is, you know, as well as I could hope, but that's not enough money to excuse me from going back to work. I mean, I'm not getting that kind of money handed out to me. It's nice, but it's not the world. So how on earth are people doing that? But I think you're right. I think it is a patchwork across the board of, different things that are applying to people in different ways. And we're just looking at that in total and saying, well, nobody wants to go back to work. I wonder why. So this is almost a a complete non sequitur, but I I need to talk about this just as a personal thing, right? There's a group of people in this world and I don't understand them. They are the people who their school provides transportation for their kids. (laughs) The bus will pick them up at their door and drop them back off. But still, these parents drive their kids to school. And it's it's not like it was when we were growing up either. When when you drove a kid to school, when we were growing up, I'll slow down and throw you out the door and then pull away. No, there's a 45 minute line to, to pick your kid up or to drop your kid off. They will deliver it for free right to your house what what is going you have to explain it to me matt because i do not understand these people i i honestly struggle with that one myself i don't know if it's a matter of it's cutting it too close and they don't want to leave their kid home alone for the five minutes or ten minutes between they have to go to work and the bus would get there that would be an extremely limited population though that would be I, I, I try to think of it from all angles. That That's something that I would weigh if I had a small kid. Teenagers, no. Like, I don't get the, the driving the teenagers to school. Right. And, but I'm also a little hardened to the whole buses and riding to school because 12 years of school, I got to ride a bus for a solid month. I had to walk. Yeah. Like, I... In, in elementary and middle school, I lived near those enough that I was within the radius that they said, screw you, no bus, start walking. So I had to walk every day. And then got to high school. High school was across town. Yay, I get to ride a bus, which, by the way, uh, I had never experienced riding on a bus as a regular kid before. Like, I've ridden them on field trips and whatnot. It's not great. But the it's dead fine, of winter though. being the first one on the bus right after it leaves the bus garage and that that is just a giant frozen tin can that you sit in with no heat. (laughs) Like, Oh, I don't think I like this very much. Right. Well, a month later we moved happened to be right near the high school. So back to walking. So three more years of that and I got to finish it up. But it's, it's a little crazy. As far as other reasons that people would do it. I I do. I struggle with that because I have asked that my wife and I talked about that the other day. Like what are all these people doing? We'll drop our kids off if there's an emergency issue. Something has come up. There's an appointment for whatever reason. Or if they miss the bus, yeah, we're stuck driving them. Or it's their birthday and you're free or, you know, once. Exactly. Once every three months, maybe, I will pick my kid up from school. And the the only other thing I could think is if you've decided that buses, for some reason, have a bad reputation, like, uh, you know, you don't want your kid hanging out with whatever other kids right. are on the but bus. That's, but no, that is so crazy. You're spending they're going the to the same day. school. You're right. They're, the they're bus all going is to the, the same least school. of your worries. And when we were kids, it was a free for all. Okay. We yeah. all sat, everyone sat in the back of the bus and they did whatever the hell they wanted. The number of cigarette lighters burned into the back of bus oh, seats yeah. that I have seen. And I never understood why, but I, once I realized what that little mark was, I was like, really, there's all these people that just sit here and heat up lighters and burn the back of the seat. But now there's always a friggin' bus monitor. 
and they take crap so seriously. Like there's cameras and we just had a bus driver that would pull over and turn around and yell at everybody. Yeah. Cameras were toward the end of our tenure in school. And then they were so bad that they couldn't actually see anything, just that bad things happened. But even the fact that now pretty much every kid, at least in our County, I think is guaranteed a bus ride, right? doesn't matter how close you live to that school. If you want to get on a bus, they will let you ride that bus. And yep. it it's one of those things that the data doesn't follow, right? The data suggests your kids are safer walking to school than they have ever been before, right? Mm-hmm. But people don't believe it. Yeah. I, I think maybe some parents just care more about their kids than they do. I don't know. But still, it seems like a poor choice, right? If you're going to spend an hour and a half every day of your life attending to one of your kids needs it, is there literally there's nothing better you could bake them a freaking cake right make them some cookies <laughs> clean their room uh, all and play catch with them when they get home I, I driving and sitting there in that pickup no Mm-mm, yeah not I don't, for me i don't i don't get where that that comes from at all yeah but hey if you guys do Put it down in the comment section. We'd like to know. Or the Discord. Find us in the Discord. Or the Discord. Yeah. I I don't know. Like you said, detailers are, are a shy bunch of people. You, do you think that's why detailers end up in their basement so often? Could be. Is that, that like we hate everybody, right? So we're just like, I'm just, there's a place in my basement. I'm not going to argue. I'm just going to go and hide in that hole. And I will, I'll send you drawings if you leave me alone. You know, I feel like it's some sort of a stereotype that detailers just hate sunlight. But as much as I want to be against that, there's a window that's up behind my monitors. Yeah. And I have the monitors covering it. And every now and then I look up at it and go, my next project is to wall that window off. Yeah. So our next episode, want that are steel down. detailers actually part vampire? There we go. Maybe it could happen. I don't know. I, I do. I am constantly tempted. Like my office, as you can see, is in the middle of my living room. And it means that I am more connected to my family when they're here, which my family enjoys. Right. <sighs> <laughs> I I like quiet. I really like. I, I will either be, and I'm not an introvert at all, right? I'm definitely an extrovert. When I am out with people, full on extrovert. But when I'm doing, I just bubble. When I come out of the bubble, you can talk to me, and we'll have a great time. But when I'm in the bubble, leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you, right? I'm drawing. I got music on. I got a movie on. I've got, I, and I'll legitimately, I'll have an audiobook playing, I'll have music on, and then I'll have some movie or, you know, The Simpsons or something I don't actually have to watch because I've seen it so many times going. And that's how I get my best work done. Try to do that in a traditional, you know, office environment and see what your boss says to you when, you, when you've got The sure. Simpsons on. Well, and that's why we wear the headphones. Like when I've got the headphones on, everyone else out there needs to shush. If you want to contact me, you could call me on my Google voice, which will ring into my headphones. You know, right. Talk to me that way, but I'll hear general talking and I get so frustrated because I'll hear general talking. I take the headphones off. I assume they're addressing me and they all look what we're not talking to you and they'll get mad at me. So then they're talking and I refuse to take the headphones off. I will not look over. I will not acknowledge I'm working on something. And then all of a sudden I got somebody leaning over into my you know workspace here, face right up to me. I'm talking to you. Yeah. How would I know? You didn't get my attention. I, uh, my wife, for the first couple of years of our marriage, I, you know, I put in place this policy that if you don't say my name and wait for me to acknowledge that you're speaking, whatever you say does not count. You did not tell me that. (laughs) It's lost. (laughs) Right. mm, You might've been talking in my direction. I might've even been, you know, nodding or uh uh-huh, uh-huh, whatever. Nope. Doesn't count. Autopilot is strong. Yeah. Oh, real strong now. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, so that 
kind of our, our next episode, what I, I want to talk about, and it, it's going to require a little bit more preparation, and I don't know how I'm going to do it. It's probably going to end up being less than I imagine it. Like I have this great picture in my head, but it's not going to be that way. I want to demonstrate how our, the software that we have today, SDS2, AutoCAD, Tecla, they're all the, they, they, they've all, they're all stuck in 1080p single monitor land, right? Where like you just look at this window and that's, everything is right there. The buttons and modern software, right? Uh, your Photoshop, your Premiere Pro, um, the, the 3D design software, U- Unity, gaming engine, right? right? It, that's not how it is. You're presenting, you've got, you've got a main work area and then there's another work area and another work area and you've got different, like the, the ribbon interface was just the beginning, right? Yes, right. your interface should be customized based on the task at hand, right? But it shouldn't end at what buttons you have in front of you. That's ridiculous. I need to see different things if I'm putting on poor stop than I do if I'm doing bulk beam entry right? Whole different process. Sure. If I'm checking a set of drawings, I want to see a whole different set of things, right? Right. right. If, if That's I'm going profiles through profiles could even come into play. Right. But we need more windows that are useful. And like the, the tile interface is great. Okay. Yes. But all I see there is the same presentation of the model, right? I need a, a, a window that's going to show me, okay, every time you select a beam, it's going to show you that beam in the true, you know, the, the isolated view with the dimensions applied, or you could specify it however you want. If I select a connection, Hey, this window over here is going to pop up all those connection details, all of that stuff where your it, that interface is truly customized to what it is that you're doing. It's not just a different set of buttons, right? It's a whole right. different, and you've worked in premiere pro. Right. That's a really right. good example of that. Right. When you yes. click, when you switch from editing to color changing to assembly, the whole interface changes. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's how it, it really should be. And right. I, I and it's think similar in After Effects and Illustrator, Photoshop, they've got all kinds of different. Basically, that whole Adobe package has a lot of stuff like that. And that is a very common thing that we're seeing. Honestly, <sighs> I struggle with that because I wonder how many detailers are so set in their ways and they, it's not that they, they, just, they want to be left behind. Like they're happy to work on a single 1080p monitor. And that's a demographic that SDS and Tecla and AutoCAD, they have to, they have to deal with because right. these people bought their software. And so we can't just leave them behind. We, we need to keep collecting our money. So it's like, how do you nudge your customers to move in the right direction? You have to overwhelm them with a better interface, right? Like it needs to be so demonstrably clear that, hey, this way is better. There is so much here to offer you that you, there's no question, right? But back to the, you know, I said they're stuck in a 1080p world. That's really true. You could not only present this much information on a 1080p screen, you needed all right. of those pixels Absolutely. to show the model, right? And to get the information, but it's actually still pretty much enough information, a 1080p window to see that plan view of your model or the elevation view of the model. If those other, if you've got other information around that screen, that's useful, really useful to you. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying you're, always stuck in that windowed mode. No, if you're doing bulk entry, all of that stuff goes away. You're in bulk entry mode. But if you're, if you're doing, if you're nitty pick your nitty gritty connection editing, you get a whole different set of windows that are available to you. If you're going through and doing your member isolates again, a whole different set of windows to you. And it, it, it's, a whole different way of thinking. And when, when we were talking to Adi at the conference, he was asking, you know, what do you think of the new interface? You know, it's, it's like, yeah, I I like the direction you're going. It's better, but what was missing? I feel like this is what I was trying to get out. Right. To convey. Sure. Right. But I couldn't, like, I wasn't sure what was missing. 
because I'm not an, inter an interface designer. I know that there was modern software that I liked a lot that didn't feel this way, but that wasn't it. But the, uh, the other side of that, that maybe SDS just can't keep up it, 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 in the current model is you can't have that tick, 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 where things load up kind of slowly. It needs to be, you select that and this updates and this is updated and this is updated. If it, if it drags, if it's redrawing at a slow pace, like Bluebeam right. does when there's friggin' images mixed into their vector files, it's, it'll, it, it, it'll be a disaster. Well, and they are working on going true multi-threading. I, I think the way that they had implemented it was it was only doing multi-threading when you detailed members, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. And, and now they're working on actually breaking into that properly for everything. And that is going to make some serious use of your system, which it has. It, Great. You, know? you, you buy this phenomenal system and you think it's going to kick ass and it's got eight cores and all this memory and, you know, everything's great about it. And the software only utilizes a fraction of it. But when I run a game, it works so great. It's like, yeah, because the game is optimized for that hardware. But I don't know if it's just out of it, it took them that long to, to move along to it or if it's taking detailers this long to demand it because we just haven't upgraded our hardware. But now that we're starting to see that, we're actually going to maybe get some utilization out of these crazy gaming systems that a lot of us build. Like when we set up our stations it, initially, it was almost an ego thing. Like, oh, I've got four monitors yeah. and they're yeah. huge. And, yeah, but half of it I'm running, you know, YouTube on while I'm working and, and you know, it's chat. Now, my my entire system, and I'm running three 4Ks right now. I dropped the fourth, um, but I'm running three full 4K monitors, and I use every bit of real estate, and now I've added on a stream deck, and uh, I, actually, I've, we'll get into that another time, but I, I think that's actually going to prove really useful uh, for just our workflows. But trying to keep up with what's the latest hardware is an issue that software developers that create productivity software don't seem to really stick to as much. But the gaming community is all over it. You yeah. know, if, if a new graphics engine comes out, if you know the RTX came out, Boom. all the all the games immediately went, we've got to have ray tracing, we've got to have ray tracing. We want to fill whatever void that hardware has created. I need to be the first one to market to use that new hardware. But that means that I'm relying on a customer base that's going to buy that new hardware. Otherwise it's wasted. If I play Minecraft because I don't have, you know, a, a brand new ray tracing graphics card. Cause I just, I'm not dropping $5,000 to a scalper. Uh, th then I don't get the benefit of ray tracing. So it doesn't matter to me. If I keep my older hardware, I don't get the benefit of that newer software. So trying to find that balance where they have to support the new hardware, up in the mic, where they support the new hardware and the old hardware, that's tough. It, I mean, that, that's that got to be a, a difficult balancing act, especially when you're talking about software that people use to make money, not to have fun. Yeah. You know? But there's two, ironically, the two slowest softwares that I use are both within the Nemechek family, right? SDS2 and Bluebeam. And both have things that I am not willing to live without. Right. So that's why I keep them. But, but Bluebeam's rendering is a joke. It's terrible, right? Like I have, I can render faster on my phone than Bluebeam does I on my gaming PC. Is. Yeah, I, I really, I would love to know why that is. Why do we have that issue? Because you throw it into a different piece of software, another PDF viewer, and it runs fine. Oh yeah, PDF Exchange Pro, which but if, if you're out there and if, if you're not using the custom markup tools with Bluebeam, don't use Bluebeam. It's not worth, it's not worth the money. It is certainly not worth the time, right? Yeah, if if you're if you're doing custom but columns, you need Bluey. You need to be using custom columns. That's yes. I think that's the greater point. Is yeah. you need to be using those custom columns. Like for all the headache that it is, we don't walk away because it's that valuable to use those custom but there, columns. There are times when Bluebeam is so slow 
that I it, it is literally unusable for me that I have to open stuff up in PDF Exchange Pro, lose those extra tools. I'll just keep a spreadsheet running next to me because it's that much faster. It's it's ridiculous. No excuse for it, right? And and I literally those same PDFs I will throw over to my my Galaxy Tab, my tablet. I can scroll through them like this, and they just no problem. Zoom, pan, flick, draw, whatever I want to do, no problem. So, I Bluebeam, get your act together. I figure it out. And you know, if I had my way too, it wouldn't be Bluebeam trying to acquire PDF Exchange Pro's rendering engine. I would add Bluebeam's custom markups to PDF Exchange Pro. It is that much faster, that much cleaner of a But that would be it. That would be the easier fix too. Right. It's just adding in some simple data sets as opposed to cramming a revised rendering engine yeah. into existing And there's software. there's a file format for it. I think it, I, I believe it's called FDF format. I've done a little bit of research on you know how you can add custom It's all built in there just like it was for DXF, right? If you if you open an FDF file Right, which is what you can export Bluebeam comments to or any other PDF comments to. It's just a plain text file. You can just scroll through there and find the line that you're looking for. Whereas a PDF markup file, Bluebeam markup file, classically, right, is encoded. You can't do anything with that file. It's useless to you outside of importing, importing it to Bluebeam, which maybe that's what makes it slow. I have no idea. I have no idea, right, but right. we've got no inside knowledge as to how right. that functions. Really we've got videos inside. that do tell you if, if you've got a particularly bad PDF file, how to fix it, how to make it render faster, but it's still not anywhere as quick and you shouldn't have to do it. There's no reason I've got, oh, I don't know, a three gigahertz processor with six cores and a freaking thousand dollar graphics card. I can render games at, 60 frames per second at 4k but i can't render a freaking drawing of a floor plan are you kidding me <laughs> come on yeah that that hurts Get your shit feelings. together so it, it's funny too i will i've uh, you know i experimented a little bit with vr and you can take pdfs and you can put them in a vr world right and make it the size of a desk and you can Paint, you can look at it and you can just step closer and look at the detail. Really cool, right? There's there's definitely a place there. That's one thing where I think VR has a future, right? If I could look there, if I could just highlight on the screen and make notes, I would absolutely do that. It's not there yet because there's nobody working really on productivity in VR for whatever right. reason. It's mostly gaming, but it's going to get there. You know, it's going to there, be cool. There's an idea. Uh, those of you software developers, be first to market. Yeah. Well, even a, a legitimate VR viewer for a model, right? I There is no path, no efficient path, I will say for certain, from an SDS2 model to a .obj file, which you can imp import into SketchUp as a VR. And you can .objs, you can bring into all sorts of different VR programs. Because I would love to be able to literally jump into a model and be able to grab that model, blow it up, bring it closer, move it around. Okay. Here's this connection. All right. I'm going to look at it from all the sides. You know, it, maybe it's not truly faster, but it certainly feels more immersive, right? Sure. Which is important to software fatigue. Right. So let me ask you, uh, is there a way to convert like say a, a U3D or something like a, a 3D PDF into an OBJ? There there's there's no direct path there are conversions you can convert and then reconvert mm -hmm. right but there's no you open it here and then it saves there and okay. once you do that reconvert it's you're gonna lose data every time too yeah and it's not just the date it's the speed there's there's something uh, a an ifc file i the way it exports its geometry, I think is weird, maybe even outdated. I don't know. I'm not that much of a, of a nerd, uh, but it definitely feels different. Those files are much, much bigger. Um, 
and it's not what I need, right? I just, I need to be able to see it. I don't need all of this. I don't need all of that data attached to it. Not yet anyways, but soon, soon you will. Soon. I would, I would love it. So let us know what your thoughts are about virtual reality. Do you play any virtual reality games? Do you play games in general? If you do find us on the discord server, if you're streaming, let us know down there and we will see you back here 